Good afternoon, everyone. I, uh, I believe I'm the last speaker for today. So, yay, I think. <laughs> Everybody's uh, a little bit tired, but I know that there was a lot of, uh, a lot of great interaction and a lot of great ex exchanges of ideas. And uh, thankfully, there's uh, a couple of more opportunities to, uh, to discuss. Now, I think I am one of the very few speakers for today that would be coming from the private sector and offering some, some insight on what we see in terms of labor market information and uh, primarily the trends, the trends that we, uh, we talk about and, and we see and feel and live through uh, every day. Um, I think the other person was uh, our, our speaker from this morning, uh, Mr. Luis Anastasio, a very good friend, a great colleague of mine. Uh, we were together in Japan and he's from the SFI group of companies. So he and I were, were discussing about what we can share with you in terms of uh, our knowledge and experience from the private sector. So um, with, with that, uh, let me begin. Um, oh, I have the clicker. There. Um, this, is, uh, this is my uh, prepared topic for today, but I think perhaps the, the, the term, the human age, may, uh, may be a little bit controversial to, to some of you. I'm not sure if this is something that you've heard before, but uh, Manpower Group has uh, announced that we have entered the, uh, the human age. Uh, a few years ago, I think it was about 2012, in, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, and um, what, what is it? What is the human age? L let me, I, I guess, start by saying the, the earlier versions of the, the other ages or the other eras where uh, history of man began, or, or modern man at least. Um, the human age basically encapsulates the shift from the value of capital to talent. We've defined the many eras. Uh, man has controlled raw materials and bent his bent these to his will. So these, these eras would be your Stone Age, your Iron Age, and, and the Bronze Age. These, these are things that none of us really lived through, right? I, I don't think. All of us here are very, very young, and uh, we've, we've never lived through that. I, I guess the more modern ones that we are more familiar with would be the, um, the Information Age or the Space Age. And th those would be characterized by uh, the, the heightened and, and uh, advanced technologies that were developed maybe just a couple of, uh, uh, just a couple of decades ago. Now we, we go to the human age, as I said, and this is marked really by the ingenuity of the individual and the collaboration of the community and the empowerment of talent. And when I said earlier that it's now a shift from capital to talent, th that's, that's essentially what, what it is. It's no longer companies that control capital, that ensure or dictate the future. It's those that are able to control or manage their, their requirement for talent as they tie it up to their, to their business goals. Um, essentially, you cannot grow uh, without, without having the right talent. Necessarily, technology has to be a big part of that mix, but talent will always be there, and uh, it's, it's time that we recognize that, and we call that a change in, uh, in history. So uh, with that, let me just say that as a company, we believe that we are now at a time of certain uncertainty, and uh, what do I mean by that? When I look at this slide, I can't help but think about the, the recent recession of uh, 2008 and 2009, you know, where I, I was in Japan at that time, and a few years just before that, things were good, things were normal. We like normal, we know how to manage normal, but then 2008, 2009 came, and we were through a real recession. We, uh, we managed to get out of that around 2012, for some countries, even earlier, 2010, and uh, many, many of the leaders of, of the business communities were really breathing a great sigh of relief because, okay, uh, we're, we're going back to normal. But as we made that turn, we actually realized after a couple of years that it was not going to be as it was back before this, this last recession. So that's the, 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 re 
the uh, the rebound um, the rebound is not really um, the same as in previous recessions because of a marked difference in terms of the speed of uh, of recovery and even till till now there is still a very uh, cautioned approach in terms of investing um, especially on talent on people on how to grow so we are still seeing a, a good amount of uh, of crunch in uh, in unemployment in certain areas and and even underemployment in in most areas it will be different from market to market as you are more mature or more industrialized but uh, that has been our observation in uh, in recent in, uh, of that recent uh, recession now i uh, i want to be able to qualify where we are getting these information and uh, with that I just want to be able to move to the next slide to just tell you where we get our data. So as, as an organization, Man, Manpower Group is, um, you know, we're, we're almost 70 years old. We are, uh, we are an American company born out of uh, Milwaukee. Uh, we were opened in 1948. So we've, we've been around quite a bit. We, um, we, as, as a U.S. company, we have a little odd distinction of having 85% of our business uh, being generated outside the U.S. So it's, there's really a huge amount of, of information that we are getting from the other regions of Europe, Latin America, Asia Pacific, certainly. Um, we also have, uh, in our experience, annually uh, been interviewing 12 million people who are looking for work. We train about 11 million people, um, not to mention the thousands and thousands of, uh, of business leaders that we have direct contact with in all these 80 countries where we operate. So in any given time, like uh, in a day like today, we are employing at the very least 600,000 people um, at any point. So that's, that's a huge amount of, of information. And certainly, it, it's been a delight for us as an organization where we've grown from 1948 to where we are, and, and that's great. Um, but again, it's, it's access to this kind of labor information that is uh, very, very useful, not only to us as an organization as we map out and structure our future plans, but also to our clients uh, where you know, we, we freely and openly share our, uh, our gathered information. And we, we at, the end of this, at the end of this talk, I'll be giving you access to, to some information that I think might be, uh, might be useful. I know that the Department of Labor and Employment in the Philippines are uh, very familiar with the kinds of studies that we at Manpower Group do, and uh, we, we would like to offer it to the people of the other countries that are present here today. Okay, so um, we go to the world of work trends, and um, well, I'm, uh, I'm just going to look at my notes here. During the course of, of these 70 years, we've, uh, we've seen quite a bit of changes, and uh, what, what, is must, what is really markedly different in, in very recent years are the structural changes that have happened in, in the labor force and, and then in the business world. And I present here to you the, uh, the, the four major factors that affect, that affect business today. So you have here demographics. There's huge talent, talent mismatch that's been happening as working age population declines and the nature of work changes. Uh, there's individual choice. Um, more and more people, especially the skilled ones, have, have the value uh, about within themselves to say no if you offer them a job that they don't like. There are many other opportunities available to more and more people now, especially those with the skills that are in demand. And then there's the rise of customer satisfaction. Certainly, uh, it is not one size fits all anymore. You have to be, you have to be very specific. You have to be able to uh, tailor a any kind of solution to address what what it is that your client is is looking for and of course there's uh, certainly technological revolutions um, that have as as i mentioned earlier have uh, 
really dictated the progress of, of humankind uh, for the hundreds of years that we've been around. What is not here, however, is, um, is geopolitical events that are occurring and are having much, much uh, broader impact on the world. These are the kinds of macro forces that you would recognize as you think about your environment where we all operate. For example, the refugee situation in Europe particularly comes to mind. And of course, the, the, recent, uh, the recent bubble recession in the US, uh, to give another example. These are things that, that are happening around us. It's, it's not localized anymore. Things that are happening miles and miles away have a tendency to have that ripple effect and come to our shores. So we, we really must be aware of, of these, these structural changes that are happening. And, and it's particularly interesting with, with that question about how do we plan for the future? This is one step. We need to be able to understand how demographics now is, is really affecting, affecting business. There will be several slides to further deepen the discussion, but as, as, a, as an initial sharing, uh, perhaps th these might be things to, to keep in mind. Okay, shifting demographics. On this slide, let me just uh, make the first observation, and I'm sure this is something that many of you are intimately familiar with. We live in a world where we are seeing some rapidly shifting demographics. This should be not new news, uh, since demographics is essentially mathematics, right? Um, if, if a country has, has a population where families, where couples have an average of 2.1 children, and it starts to decline, um, that, that's, the, that's the signal of, of a, a very dramatic change in, in demographics. And even in Asia, we're seeing much of this, especially within the developed countries of Asia Pacific. So let me mention countries like Japan, Korea, China, uh, Singapore is getting close there as well. Um, they, they are there. So there are um, quite a few countries, even within within Asia that are uh, getting affected by these, these types of demographic uh, factors. In the United States, it's keeping pace with 2.1, but uh, as you can see here, very, very soon by 2020, the U.S. economy's demand for labor will outstrip supply by almost 18 million people. Now, that's, that's something that we were able to gather based on the interviews uh, and studies from our, um, from our surveys, which we've been doing for quite a few decades now, over 50 countries. So that's really interesting. China is close to peaking in terms of growth for their workforce and population. Certainly this is an effect of the one-child policy that they had for decades. And uh, I, I'm not sure if we still have our Japanese uh, colleague here today, but if you were able to catch these, uh, this piece of news a few weeks ago, in Japan, for the 34th consecutive year, there has been a decline of 16-year-olds, year on year, population comparison. So that's 34 years. It's, it's, um, it's an amazing, uh, I guess amazing is one word to, to put it, but that's, uh, that's certainly dramatic, and it, it really signals a very urgent uh, need for a country like Japan, and perhaps even Korea as uh, Dr. Yu mentioned earlier, where, where 20 years from now, there's gonna be a huge population imbalance. Um, so there. Um, population is important, and, and why? Why is this important? For economies to grow, you can have two levers. One is population growth. So individuals that participate in the workforce help generate growth in the economy, which manifests itself as gross for the gross domestic product. So GDP, obviously. Uh, and the other, preferably in combination with, with population growth, would be, um, would be a, another lever for, for countries to grow is uh, increasing in, in uh, productivity. These, these are the two levers to create prosperity and wealth so that countries can take care of their population. And that's why this is such a big issue for us. Um, I think for everybody, for countries like Korea and Japan, say, 
the aging, the aging population for a country like the Philippines, how are we going to be able to absorb the very young population that is still growing over the next 50 years? So that's uh, from a world of work perspective, it's, it's very important as, um, as we see advanced countries having less and less workers and, and some of the developing countries having many workers, but not necessarily the kind of skills to be able to address these, these workers. There's, there's that supply and demand thing that we have to, to, have to figure out and balance. And, uh, and that's, that's another thing that we, as, as people in public service and even the private sector, need to be able to address. We as Manpower Group are very, very committed to understanding these kinds of changes as we, we are, we are, while we are present in 80 countries, we need to be able to address the, the needs of our clients in these 80 countries. So, yeah, we do it for business, but really it's, it's, it's the job of everybody. It's, it is important. I, uh, I remember an anecdote uh, that my, my Japanese friend always tells me is that, you know, 10, 20 years from now, we will have half of the population in Japan and Korea living in the Philippines uh, because this is going to be their retirement home. And then half of the Philippine population will learn Japanese and Korean because they're going to need to support the aging population there. That may be a little bit extreme or maybe it isn't. But certainly it's uh, a certain part of that is reality. And that can be prepared for as early as now. So, you know, again, another thing to think about. Ah, okay. Um, I think my anecdote talked about migration a little bit. I'm going to sh shift gears a little and, and go local and uh, present to our foreign guests a little bit about the uh, information on overseas Filipino workers. Now, we'll see here on this trend that it's been consistently going up since 2010. And by 2015, we're sure that this will be going way over 2 million people working as official um, overseas Filipino workers. They're, there's probably a good percentage also that we are unable to capture there, but, but it is what it is. You'll see that that trend continues. The blue bar represents land-based positions, and the green, the green portion represents sea-based positions there. Um, you'll also notice on this slide that while um, I, I believe service workers or domestic workers would constitute most of the number, there has been an increasing diversity in uh, different roles, as well as different locations that overseas Filipino workers are going to. Um, Middle Eastern countries, primarily destinations uh, like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, remain to be top destinations, and I'm sure it will continue to be with the kind of progress that uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, as well as the Middle East region, have in store for the next few years in terms of construction, and uh, social support for families, expatriate families that are living there. Uh, one of the very positive things that OFWs bring to the country would be their remittances. And it's now October, just certainly a couple of months from now, uh, during Christmas time, we will see a huge amount of influx of, of dollars flowing in. Last year, we were able to, according to the Central Bank of the Philippines, uh, we, we were able to generate remittances from the OFWs to the tune of 26.9 billion U.S. dollars, a 6% increase from the year before of 25 billion. And again, it's being projected to increase by another 6% this year. So consistently, together with the trend of increasing population of OFW, OFWs, we know that, uh, that remittances, which constituted last year about 8.5% of GDP, will continue to grow. It's, it's, it's good and bad, you know, when I think about it, because there is brain drain, certainly there is, uh, but without the, uh, without the ability to absorb locally for, for all of these skilled workers or, or, or workers um, in the Philippines, it is perhaps the next best, best thing to be able to address um, financial needs by going overseas, but it has, it has its social consequences. Perhaps that might be a, a really long discussion. We probably don't need to discuss that now, but be that as it may, the Philippines is an OFW country. We have that culture, and I believe that 
in the next 20, 10, 20 years or so, we will be supplying a lot more people to the non-traditional countries. So while we see here Saudi Arabia, I think the, the letter's a little too small, UAE, again, Middle Eastern countries, but there's Taiwan, Malaysia, Bahrain, and Canada there. We, as, as an organization, have, have already established newer mar markets like uh, Japan. We, uh, Japan is a very difficult market to penetrate, primarily because of the language. But uh, as an organization, we were able to send a couple of hundred IT engineers from the Philippines, train them in Japanese and IT skills, and brought them to Japan. We've also seen, uh, okay, if, if we extend that story a little bit, after seeing the success of the Philippines, our other countries in, in India and Taiwan and Korea had followed suit. So now our clients that are uh, experiencing some, some issues in Japan are able to hire Filipinos, Taiwanese, Indians, and, and Koreans. We're, we're seeing a shift and a more openness from a country so typically closed like Japan and opening its gates to us. We see New Zealand. New Zealand, while a population of, what, four million people? Uh, it certainly needs a lot of help. Their, their, their immigration, uh, at least uh, for Filipinos, uh, are a little bit difficult, but they've been opening up as well. Uh, if you remember, there were a couple of huge earthquakes in Christchurch that happened in 2009, 2010, I think, somewhere along those years, and now they're committed to building Christchurch and have opened their doors to Filipino skilled workers, carpenters, steel fixers. My colleague of mine just came back from New Zealand training, um, training our guys there. So we're, we're seeing a, a change and a shift um, from a Philippines perspective, and I believe that will be happening uh, as well in the other regions. We see similar things happening in Europe, where Poland is becoming much more uh, acceptable to, uh, to other parts of Europe in terms of outsourcing, outsourcing things. Uh, or manufacturing, and uh, in the U.S., the Latin American countries are also becoming uh, much more active in uh, in helping North America get back get back on its feet. Uh, as the growth in America, while a recession has already turned, is is still growing at a very slow pace. Ah, interesting slide. I like this slide. Um, I don't think we have anybody here who we would call it out to be in the in the first uh, in the first hierarchy of generations, but but maybe so. Even then, what 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 this tells me is we are now in a reality or in in an era where there are five different generations that you could be working with in your office right now. Uh, some, in some countries, retirement ages are young and, and they're forced, perhaps, but in some, they are not. And we're finding more and more people are uh, working much longer than uh, what, it, well, what traditionally has been, uh, would be a, a retirement age. And uh, it's, it's changing, it's, change, it's changing the landscape of, of offices, of business environments, and as employers, <laughs> and as employers, we are, uh, we are faced with the challenge of having to deal with five different types of personalities and traits. How do we, how do we attract these people? How do we, how do we keep them? It, these are all very different things, and, and we need to be able to understand that this is part of demographics that we have to deal with if we are to work with the future, especially as you focus on Gen Y and Gen Z, because these are the guys that's, that's going to be coming into the workforce uh, very, very soon and in, in dregs. And they're, they're the type of people that get very bored easily. In fact, we, we project that the millennials are, are that part of the workforce that will probably have about 12 to 14 employers by the time they retire. Not not typical of, I think, our generation. So how do we deal with that? I've been told that I have three minutes left, so I'm really going to have to step it up. Um, technolo technology and displacement of jobs. Um, I think what 
the, the slide speaks for itself. Just again, the, the amount and rapid, rapid change of technology has, has given rise to a lot of challenges for, uh, for us. And we cannot afford to stay where we are and operate the way we have been. We have to change and we need to, we need to be able to adapt. Um, this is where the millennials really will come in. So it's very important for us to have a plan for the millennials. Bifurcation of skills. I, I, essentially what this means is that there's, there's a lot of demand um, and, and a lot of people elsewhere, but they don't match. There's a huge demand here and there's a huge supply there, but they just don't match. And, you know, we have to be able to find a way to, to be able to transfer that ability to support that demand. And um, it's, it's going to be difficult if we don't make those plans now. Sorry, I'm a little bit speeding up, but I'd love to be able to discuss with you after this. Um, wage inflation. This is one of, those, uh, one of those really sensitive things. I personally have my own theory about wage inflation and, and bifurcation of the workforce because, again, with, with a huge supply of people with lower skills or unmatched skills, it has a dampening effect on wage inflation. While wage should be going up, companies are not willing to pay that price because the, the skill level is low. But this is the supply. What are you going to do? It, it doesn't match. And if, if we see here, particularly in, like, if you're below the 100, so Italy and United Kingdom, it's not growing. It's, there's a crunch. There's, there's, there's a problem in that region. We need to be able to address that. And I think us here in this, this room and, and the countries that are present here are within, within our abilities to be able to address that. We need to understand what these things are first, and I think uh, I'm, I'm really happy that I'm able to share these types of information with you. Not that you don't know them, but again, just bringing it uh, up front. Um, just very quickly, obviously, salary wages are very different between the countries, between the developed countries in, in Asia and, and uh, the less developed ones. But you will see that the growth in wage, uh, uh, wage rate has been higher in Asia than the rest of the world. There has been uh, a little bit of stability, I suppose, or a little bit more growth in Asia Pacific compared to the other regions. And uh, th then again, we started at a very low base. So percentage-wise, we certainly have had um, comparatively better growth rate. Um, OK, future of workforce. Um, I've isolated the red line here to represent the Philippines just to, to be able to highlight that the Philippines have, in fact, uh, done a great job in addressing uh, unemployment in recent years um, compared to Asia Pacific average and global average. Um, but again, the problem is, what are we going to do with the huge influx that's coming in between 20 to 50 years from now? Where are they going to go? <coughs> Even if they become OFWs, do they have the skill? Are we able to absorb them locally so we can keep talent? These are things that we should start thinking about now. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the top 10 uh, positions that, are, um, that, that employers are having trouble filling um, globally, regionally, and in the Philippines. I'll give you a second to just take a look. <coughs> So some similarities uh, between global and regional, some not so similar, some might be surprising. But these are information that we gather again from the 50 countries and, and, uh, and the leaders of, of businesses that we have as clients. Uh, this is an extension of the Philippine uh, setting. We got this from the Department of Labor Employment site. Um, the Dole uh, man, uh, man, we, we we'll call it manpower employment outlook is fantastic. Um, it's something uh, that really is, is a good job. <coughs> Thank you. I'm almost through. Can you give me another minute or two? Yeah. Right. Ah, this one. Um, I really don't intend to spend too much time on this. We know this is coming, but um, I don't know if it's appropriate or not to, to the topic, but just a snapshot 
and perhaps maybe some key points in the executive summary. Uh, the AEC will create a single market and, and, and production base of new opportunities for prosperity for the region for the 600 million men and women of, of Asia, ASEAN. So that's, that's wonderful news. Building connectivity is key to the AEC vision of sustained growth and equitable development. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> The AEC will also accelerate pace of structural change, the changes that I, uh, I had showed earlier. Demand will increase rapidly for some skills, but decrease for others. At the same time, enterprises will need to attract and retain skilled workers by offering better wages to compete on a basis of higher productivity. And uh, finally, to realize the full potential of the AEC, we need to deliver more and better jobs uh, Divisive, uh, dis decisive action is necessary, including better management of structural change. So again, it, it really boils down to understanding what these factors are, what are these changes, because we're talking about the future. <clears throat> I'm down to my last two. Yeah. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So before I move on to the final slide, I'd just like to present this word map. Of, of the many world of work trends and realities that we're facing today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the new normal. As leaders of company and industry, it is not just our vision of the future for our products and services we should be experts at. <clears throat> we should le really learn to become more like a certain type of economist and learn to the delicate balance of supply and demand of talent, how we can attract the best and how we can keep them. In business, it's no longer who controls capital, as I mentioned earlier, but those who have figured out the formula for talent management and tie this up with the, the bottom line, the business direction, these are the ones that will, uh, will win. It's no longer a game of capitalism, it's about talentism. As we have entered the human age, and if we've been here quite a while now, we have to, we have to learn about demographics and how effectively uh, we can interact with the different types of people, the millennials, the boomers, the Gen Xers. And um, our organizations, whether private or public, will, uh, will need the information and the insight of future trends as, uh, as well as an, an analysis of the past to be able to map out our future. Um, so I present that um, we really should make an effort to, to understand these, uh, these structural changes, become that type of economist and understand the supply and demand, not just locally, but within, within the, the confines of the globe, really, because it's not just local. It will affect you. It will affect us. We need to be able to understand that, to be effective in our jobs, to map out our future. <clears throat> the macroeconomic forces are growing stronger and more intertwined, pushing and pulling in different directions. And, you know, much like something that you can't separate, like a Gordian knot, it's, it affects everything and, and we have to be ready. That's, that's, all, that's, that's all there is to it. We have no choice. Therefore, access to insight from leaders from as many countries as possible in terms of future demand and current struggles will arm us with the ability to navigate through the constantly evolving, changing world of work. If you were not so inclined before, I offer you to seriously consider factoring in the importance of HR and talent management into your organizational strategies. It is <clears throat> talent is not an infinite resource, but it holds the key for growth for the growth engines of your and our social and economic ecosystems. <coughs> so last, this is the last slide. I think just out of the things that I've already said, being in the private sector, I believe this is one of those things that we should be doing. We should become a talent destination. We should try to attract. And these are the things, at least three of them, that we should start thinking about. Talent resourcing, what does that mean? It, it just means we should be asking these questions. Do we know our talent supply? Do they have to be local? Especially with the integration coming in with ASEAN, is, is, is it really just within the Philippines or within Manila or wherever that we should be looking at? How can we optimize talent that we already have? Keep good ones, you know, train them. 
What talent strategies can we deploy to reach undertapped and untapped talent pools? Certainly a loaded question. Then we move to talent management. How do we manage talent to drive productivity? <clears throat> How do we manage a diverse workforce? Different ages, different needs, different desires, different strategies you'll need to be able to keep them. And how do we inject flexibility into our workforce mix? You know, 24 by 7 is, is a common thing in the Philippines now. I'm not really sure with, you know, some of the, the countries over here. But it was a hard change, but it's, it's become reality. So come Christmas, come New Year's, you'll see a lot of people still working, and they're not going to complain. How are you going to be able to get those types of people for your type of business? Things to ask. Finally, talent development. Today's practices were created with outdated assumptions, so why are we still using them? For example, 8 to 5. Really, do we still have to work 8 to 5? Do we have to be in the office? I'm not saying go ahead and change that radically, but something to think about. Maybe it applies to some people, maybe it doesn't. It could be a harmonious middle ground. Not sure. You have to understand your local situation. And then, what new practices will, need, uh, will we need in order to attract, develop, and retain talent? Again, you know, ju not just being an economist, you also have to be a little bit of a marketer. How do I attract the talent? Because when I, earlier I said it's individual choice. People now have the choice. They have so many choices, not just locally. They can cross, cross the street, take a boat, go to, go to Singapore, no visa, and work. We need to be able to keep them if we want them. These are questions to ask. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I, uh, I'm sorry I went over, but uh, I, had, I had fun delivering that. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Sir Romel Roque. I, this is a very interesting, I find this presentation very interesting. A lot of new, uh, unfamiliar words, like certain, uh, not really unfamiliar, but I've never really heard of these uncert uh, certain uncertainty, new normal, and so on and so forth. He also put uh, stress on the population imbalances, specifically uh, in Japan, Korea, and other countries. Uh, the rapid changes brought out by globalization and technological revolution, uh, making it necessary for us to rapidly also change uh, and come to think of the outdated assumptions we had before. Maybe it's time to move on and uh, consider uh, new assumptions that is brought out by the realities uh, at the moment. So. Yeah, and uh, I really learned a lot, sir, from your presentation. I really find this interesting. Um, to continue, uh, we are opening the floor for questions. Maybe we'll, we'll entertain two to three questions uh, to our resource speaker. Uh, yeah? Are there any questions? Don't be shy. Okay, we have Kia from Germany. as well. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting um, presentation. And I was listening to this presentation with a European perspective. And I was wondering at two points in time, when you were talking about uh, the development of wage salaries, uh, you've uh, just looked at the last eight years. And then you said something about Italy and, and Greece and the, the wages are going down. And so... Um, when we uh, discuss about wages in Europe, especially uh, in regards to the crisis, we say that the biggest problem in those countries was that there was a steep increase in wages, but not in productivity. So it is good at the moment that the salaries in those countries are going down, so the match between productivity and wage is similar and not going in different directions. So perhaps it would be easier to look at 20 years and then we have the steep increase in wages, and then it's going down again. Um, so perhaps 
it's different to other regions, but I think the crisis in, in Europe has, um, yeah, we see that most countries that had a very high wage are still in the crisis, so perhaps this could be interesting. And the second thing you said is about 24-7. Uh, so when I look at Germany, that's a completely different perspective. Um, I've lived in Bavaria, that's in the very south of Germany, for a while, and that's the richest region in Germany. Um, the productivity is very high, um, the costs are very high as well, but um, they have a big industry and they're, well, that's the top of, of, of Germany. And they close their shops at 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So they still have the traditional way of working. Um, so, and in other regions, like, like Hamburg, like the very north, uh, we've opened shops until uh, yeah, midnight, uh, and the productivity is much lower than in the other region. Perhaps you can, have, you can say something about that, that your company has ideas, um, why you think that those longer days or flexible, more flexible things are better for the economy. Okay, thank you. I, uh I'm not going to pretend that I know everything about Germany, at the very least. I, I do have the data. But I think one, one thing about wages in Germany that, that strikes me is that it, it is, compared to the world, uh, already very high. Why? It's, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's a developed country. And, and I speak from a perspective of Asia, where, where comparatively, if we compare, say, uh, machine manufacturing industries, where technologies have moved from the 50 years of expertise in, in Germany to, say, a China, where China has leapfrogged that 50 years and all of a sudden are trying to race neck and neck with, with, with a country like Germany. Th there is that crunch. And then um, perhaps it's better managed from a company-to-company -company perspective in Germany, uh, the, way, the way wages will, uh, will be accepted in that market. But I think there's, there's this external force that could also be uh, putting some, some influence into that. I, uh, I'm not going to pretend I, I absolutely know that, but I know at the very least that China, as, as one country, has set its eyes on trying to be one of the manufacturing giants, much like how Germany, Austria, Switzerland, you know, the, these European countries have traditionally held that spot for the last 50 years. So um, perhaps this is a, a very good topic I can discuss with our European colleagues, particularly about Germany. Okay, thank you for that question, Kia. Maybe you can discuss that later during the networking dinner with Certainly. our guest speaker. Certainly, thank okay. you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, ma'am. Hi, Romel. Hello, ma I'm Carmen Pabitan from the Philippine uh, Professional Regulation Commission. And I understand the, the big mismatch between the huge number of labor available and the very low proportion of those who are employed. I'm wondering how your group uh, is being challenged by this information. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, yes, w while we observe these things, we certainly have the, the obligation to do something about it, uh, from not just from a social perspective, but also from a business angle. Um, we do have, uh, in certain countries, some uh, what we call manpower uh, universities, where we sort of give them scholarships to upskill people to be able to fill uh, jobs, in, in whether it's locally or internationally. For example, in Malaysia, we have a, uh, a foundation university where we train people to become uh, call center agents. Malaysia, if you don't know, are trying to compete against the Philippines uh, because of the success that we've had in the BPO industry. Uh, in the Philippines, there, TESDA is a very active organization which we tie up with to be able to upskill blue collars that are in huge demand in countries like Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, and now in, in New Zealand. It's, it's a lot of collaboration. We certainly, as, a, or, as an organization, as a private company, cannot solve all of that without help. So as much as we can, we try to collaborate with government agencies, quasi-government agencies, and, 
and other partners, um, even, the, even other private sector partners. As long as we know where the gap is, we'll try to address those as, as best as we can. I mentioned earlier about the Japan, the, the Japan experience where we sent people. And you can't just send engineers to Japan. You need to be able to equip them with the language. So you have to tie up with a language institute and, and make sure that they will operate once they land in Japan. So these things we recognize and we try to do something about them uh, as, as best as we can too. Hope okay. that answers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pabiton. Any other question? Okay. From Kenya, Joseph. Uh, you've touched on the, the wage bill. And uh, you've indicated that uh, in most cases where the wage bill goes up, uh, you find that uh, so many people go on strike, workers go on strike, just like what happened in Kenya recent trip. Teachers were demanding for a higher pay, an increment. But the government said that the wage bill was too high. Therefore, they could not get an increment. And you find that in most cases, if you look at uh, our colleges, our universities, they're increasing. We used to have around 10 universities. Now we have over 50 universities, which means that uh, the graduates are increasing. Yet jobs are not, yet, uh, jobs are not available for those uh, graduates. Now, if you are faced with uh, such a scenario, what would you do where the government is trying to reduce its wage bill? Would you recommend for its regiment? Or what would you recommend the government to do in such a situation? And yet, more graduates are coming out. Thank you very much, Joseph. That's a very uh, interesting question. Made me think about it. Um, first, I, I hope I can uh, express this in coherent thought. Um, when, you talk, when you talk about wage, it's, it's good and bad depending on what side of the fence you're sitting on. If you're on the worker side of the fence, wage being high is great. Right? If you're the employer, wage being high is not so great. Right? And uh, you, you, you have to also consider that. But as a private company, as Manpower Group, I think where we play in, in, in that delicate balance is being able to provide employment for the workforce uh, as our temporary staff workers where they can be with a company that can absorb them over a period of time, say six months here, and if that, that company says, okay, our production can no longer support these number of people, we as an organization can pull them out and transfer them to, to another uh, site. Uh, it may not ne necessarily work for everybody in the population, but as a private organization, I see that as one of the ways we can help the workforce. It's, Business is what it is. It's cyclical. There will be times where there's a high uh, need for production and there's a low need for production. And we cannot force these people, these, these companies, to just keep, say, 10,000 people when there's no need. There, there's 10,000 here and the demand for people is here. But as, as an organization, as Manpower, we could possibly help these people. If they're not needed here, we can move them to another place and take care of them, and at least they're, they're not out of work. That's, that's I think, one way. Uh, whether that, that affects wages up or down will be a case-to-case -case basis depending on the, the next company. But to me, I think what's more important is that person doesn't lose a job. I, I hope that I made some sense there and it addresses Joseph, but uh, thank you. I think I'll think about that some more tonight. <laughs> thank you for the questions and of course thank you Sir Romel for accepting our invitation and sharing with us uh, the perspective of the private sector on LMI. Okay, let's thank give you. him a big hand guys. Yeah.